Welcome to In the Envelope, a podcast from Backstage, the number one resource for actors and talent seekers. I am your host, Jack Smart, awards editor at Backstage, and I'm here to guide you through every aspect of the entertainment industry with the help of some of your favorite stars. These intimate, inspirational conversations with today's most award-worthy film, television, and theater artists provide you, dear listener, advice on how to live the creative life, personal stories of success and failure alike, and maybe, just maybe, a tantalizing glimpse in the envelope. You're going to have movies that are going to do amazing or roles that you're going to do amazing. You're going to have roles that maybe that didn't work out. Maybe try something that wasn't really the greatest thing. Fine, because you're not defined by any one of those moments. You're, gotcha. you're working toward the body of work. Hello, In the Envelope listeners. I hope we find you safe and healthy and sane. Uh, If you are tuning in to hear our wonderful interview with Michelle Prada today, you are in for a treat. Uh, She's a terrific interview, a terrific actor. And she was actually the first of our remotely recorded interviews for this run of episodes for In the Envelope. We're so excited to have her. Before we get into that interview, Michelle was featured on a backstage cover story a couple years back. We also have this really great interview with Carmen Cuba, who is the casting director for the Stars drama Vida, which is what Michelle stars on. She Carmen Cuba was the person who cast Michelle on the show. Uh, she's a very accomplished casting director. We're going to link to that story, and uh, we're going to hear from Michelle about how She was cast on Vida because it's a fantastic story, especially for actors who are early in their careers or seeking that big break. Michelle is just a great person to talk to in general for someone who has recently had her big break. Other things that we're going to be linking to in today's description, I am looking at some of the casting notices available on Backstage because it may or may not surprise you listeners to know in the age of this pandemic and quarantine, projects are very much still casting. If you want proof that casting directors, producers, directors are looking for talent for their gigs. Look no further than backstage. I'm looking at our most recent now casting post. What we have here, there is a skincare social ad for an ad campaign. There's a mental health app that needs voiceover talent. Reminder, backstage has launched a voiceover specific profile a couple months back. Um, It's a great opportunity for actors who are looking to get into voiceover, who maybe have a voiceover demo reel available. Very much animation is still casting. There are tons of commercials that still need work. If you've seen any of the commercials on TV, you know that they are clearly, some of them are very clearly recorded remotely, uh, produced remotely. There's a lot that is still happening in Hollywood that can be done remotely, including much of the casting that's happening over on Backstage.com. So we'll link to some of that in uh, this episode's description. And other than that, I don't think there's any other business to get to. Uh, I hope everyone is hanging in there. And uh, let's get to this amazing interview with Michelle, which is full of lovely wisdom for just acting and career advice, but also wisdom about how to manage these days in this strange, unprecedented time and ongoing theme for upcoming episodes. All right, let's take a quick break and hear from our sister podcast and uh, get to this interview. Hello, hello, this is Jamie, the producer of the podcast, and I just want to take some time to tell you about the sister podcast to In The Envelope, which is VO School. This is a podcast that I produce and host, and it is devoted entirely to voiceover. So if you're looking to get into the voiceover industry, you should check it out. That's VO School, found on iTunes, Stitcher, all the usual places, and it's hosted by me. Each episode covers a different subject, and we go through the business, the craft, the marketing, the blood, sweat, and tears that is creating a voiceover career. So check us out, the VO School podcast, available now.
Michelle Prada stars as Emma Hernandez on the Stars drama Vida from writer and producer Tanya Saracho and a team of Latinx writers and talent. She earned her breakout role after a run on the Emmy-nominated Fear the Walking Dead Passage and now also stars on the CW's hit Riverdale. Here it is, Backstage's Chat with the wonderful Michelle Prada. Thank you so much for joining us. You were just saying you love backstage. We love you. Oh, gosh, um, yeah. You guys are great. <laughs> yeah, yeah little theater kid brain is so excited. Good. I do think I want to, you know, this is obviously a new frontier in many ways. And, and for this podcast, too, like, we've yet to do an interview in this new, in these strange new times. Mm-hmm. So what's what's going on? How are you feeling? How has your life changed? Where are you at with the career stuff? Yeah, it's it's interesting because I... You know, everything kind of started about, I'd say about almost three years ago now with uh, the Sphere of the Walking Dead web series that I booked. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, it kind of going, that leading to Vida and then, you know, now Riverdale. And um, it just feels like it's been so nonstop. Like I got sucked in um, because I think also with Vida, not just being a normal TV show in just entertainment, Um, though I do find it entertaining, but it, you know, it being a very culturally specific and relevant, uh, show. So the press Mm -hmm. and then the shooting and all of that stuff, it's been, it's been pretty nonstop, uh, for the last almost three years now. So when this kind of all went down, um, I mean, I pretty much was on my way or I landed in Vancouver to um, shoot, you know, the last few episodes of Riverdale. And then within a few hours of me landing was told that the production was shut down. Wow. And then the next morning I was on a flight back to LA because they were trying to just get me back into the U S um, because at that point they weren't really sure what was happening, but they wow. had just announced that they were closing the European border. And that's when we didn't, you know, we, it was just, there was so much going on and it was very strange, very sci-fi I went back to my hotel room and mm-hmm. just kind of, was like, is it okay to leave? I don't know. And mm. I just stayed in my hotel room and they kept playing, uh, is like outbreak and contagion. In, in oh, no. And I was just watching that being like, this is crazy. I need to get back. <laughs> so I, I called, I live with my sister and I called her and I said, you know, I'm going to land and we're going to go straight to a grocery store. And I just want to make sure we have enough food for ourselves. Oh, yeah. And, you know, for for those of us, um, you know, in our community that might not be able to grab it because I didn't know what exactly was going on. So we kind of stopped yeah. up and pretty much since then we've been pretty self-quarantined. I think for me on a personal level, it's really been a moment of um, slowing down and mm-hmm. reflecting uh, with really what's important in our lives. And I think we're starting to see who exactly is the most important parts of our um, society. I mean, we really rest on the backs of, of just, you know, these um, healthcare workers and the grocery store employees and just, you know, the people that can't afford to take a few weeks off of work and, and survive. And I know even for me and with, for my family, if this had happened even two years ago, I wouldn't be in a position to let my mom not go to work for a few months. Yeah. Which <laughs> speaks to the, I guess, um, precariousness of Hollywood and like the industry yes. and how actors are largely paycheck to paycheck, sometimes even after quote unquote, the big break, I guess. Totally. I mean, you think that uh, you think, oh, this amount of money is going to make everything different. But the truth is, I mean, Mm -hmm. there's other bills and there's other things. And, and then also just the responsibility of taking care of each other. Then, you know, if, if we're in a position where we can do help and use our platforms to promote, um, that I think that that's the most important thing. And it kind of goes back even just that same instinct in storytelling of, you know, Connect, us connecting each other. And with a show like Vida, I think that mm. it, it bleeds into that. It's just, you know, really, really trying to understand each other and understand the way that we work as a whole, as a society, mm. as a humanity, and as storytellers. I, I like to think that 
we have a, a responsibility and an opportunity to do that for each other. You know, obviously it's fun to be entertained and that's always a good, good thing, you know, like <clears throat> having a stressful day, you want to laugh, you want to, um, just enjoy yourself, but also there being access to different stories that allow us to not feel so alone. Um, especially now at a time where we really yeah. literally are so alone <laughs> yes. um, in our houses and, um, and sometimes just, you know, and, and I know even with some of the, um, the other actors on our show, I mean, they were in the middle of shooting a few guest stars and then all of a sudden that's gone. And then what mm. do you do? Yeah. I mean, it's such a good point that there is value in entertainment right now, just because it's, it's that comfort of storytelling. It's, it's, we, uh, thank God there's so much TV. I mean, thank God that, uh, specifically season three of Vida is, was completed and can continue to roll out. It must yeah. be weird to do press now. Is this, is this like your first, are you doing a round of like these call in interviews? We are starting. You are my first on this in oh, this way. Okay, good. Uh, we have been doing, uh, I mean, I'm doing stuff that I never really thought I would do, which is like a bunch of Instagram lives, um, yeah. which is actually kind of so much more fun. And I like it because it feels like it's stepping a bit out of my comfort zone. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, Melissa and I, Melissa's in Mexico and I'm in Los Angeles. So uh, uh, Melissa, who plays my sister, Melissa Barrera, who plays my sister on the mm -hmm. show, is in Mexico and I'm in Los Angeles. And we were baking together and realizing that we've that like fun. pushed ourselves into this digital realm. Uh, yeah. out of the physical into the digital we're <laughs> essentially avatars of ourselves and doing these like group hangouts Whoa. uh which is just a very i mean it's it's so sci-fi it's so sci-fi and as you say like even two years ago like this was not this not, would not have been your life no no <laughs> i would have been freaking out like i i mean and i'm still freaking out but you know it's yes. it, i think it's yeah, I just, I wouldn't, you know, I am in a position now with three seasons of the show to be able to just, you know, take a few months off and, and, and do what we need to do and, and not feel so panicked about it. Yeah. Well, and because we're backstage, as you know, we're all about the, uh, the acting advice and it's definitely a new question for me to ask, like, what's your acting advice in regards to, yeah, a global pandemic, <laughs> like, like, what do you recommend actors do to kind of stay sharp and stay engaged and also maybe not go insane under shelter in place? Totally. I think it's an amazing time to realize you are you. Acting is something that you do and it's an expression of you. But mm. you are your art. The way you live your life, the way you wake up in the morning, the way you show up in, show up in the world, that is what is the gold. It's not the, um, you know, the role that you got or the, the poster that you want or the billboard or any of those things. You are that. And it's such an important time to nurture who you are and feel okay with not, um, you know, it's, it's this, this idea of like, who's booking that role? Who's doing, nobody's booking anything. Nobody's yeah. getting ahead in any other way other than who they are as human beings. Wow. So it's, I think that this is such an incredible lesson for that and realizing that we have so much power within our phones or our computers or our home setups mm. to create our own stuff. And that's always been the case, but we get so caught up in essentially, you know, kind of running the wheels on the ground and trying to figure out how to get here and there and get there before mm. somebody else or any of that. And now nobody's doing that. So, so wow. where does your creativity lie then? And we, I think we have these creative wells inside of us and consistently we're digging in and yanking things out. But how often do we take the time to fill it in so that there's mm. enough stuff to pull out so that it actually feels like a pleasant, fun process rather than just beating the muse to kind of keep performing. Sure. And I think that that's such a, you know, it's, and, and it not being easy because obviously there are days you wake up and you're like, Oh, this is actually kind of nice having time to myself. And then days, where you panic and yes. allowing yourself each of those days, because each of those days are just as important to the process of self-discovery um, as, as anything else and, and being kind and, and just forgiving of who you, of who you are every day. I think uh. it's such a beautiful moment for that. Um, you know, in times where it doesn't feel beautiful when you, you know, throw on the news and see what's happening. That yes, that was 
pure gold. That's exactly <laughs> that's exactly what I want to hear. I mean, it's it's true. It's like we're all kind of we have or getting back in touch with sort of like it's back to a base level, mm-hmm. and from there, like you know, what are your values and what what do you want to contribute? And yeah, maybe getting in touch with who you are as a storyteller, almost in like that vein of um, necessity is the what is it um, art uh, of invention. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, like we all have to use the what resources we have available to us to, uh, I mean, as you're saying, not play that game of advancing your career. It's more just like, how do we exist in the world? Exactly. And that's also so much more interesting, right? When you walk into an totally. audition room or a meeting with the director or casting director and you show up as this whole person that has thoughts and ideas and feelings that are aside from anything that's mm-hmm. specifically uh, acting related, that just creates just a much more interesting person to, to come yeah. in. And, and you know, you want to know what that person's thinking or what they're doing. And we can do that with our characters as well, because essentially they are people. So uh, building, building on that. And, and, uh, you know, I think we're at an incredible time where we are able to access never in the history of the world. Have you been able to access your own fan base in Mm -hmm. such large numbers, never in the history of the world. Has that, has that been possible? Mm -hmm. So this is just also a time for us to be writing, to tell our own stories, to, um, you know, even just thinking of different ideas or, or put, putting in content. I was having a really hard time concentrating the first few weeks because I, and realizing how hard I was on myself thinking, oh, yeah. oh wow, I have all this time. Now I can finish like, you know, that pilot I was trying to fin- finish and this and that, and then just somehow not con- being able to concentrate and having to speak to, you know, some of my friends that are writers and whatnot and have them say, you know, we're going through a global crisis and it's okay for you yeah. not to, not, not to feel like you have to have this instinct to do something gotcha. at all times and thinking, oh yeah, that's, that's okay. And, and then just, you know, I bought my first TV and I started watching TV because uh-huh. I, and, and finding inspiration in very unlikely play, or hmm. I guess it's not unlikely, but I wasn't expecting it. I started watching chef's table. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And whatever is going to get those juices flowing, right? Yeah. And then I woke up the next morning so inspired and so just feeling connected mm. to the stories of life. And, and obviously, you know, cooking is different than acting in its medium, but it is essentially an expression of yourself. And it's something that's mm. also really difficult to do and, and feeling really connected to that and being like, all right, now I'm ready. <laughs> Beautiful. Yeah. Cause it's, I think it's been said on this podcast before too, that like, if you're so invested in your acting career that you're not existing as a human or in taking any other like inspiration, then that, yeah, like you said, it does not inform you in the audition room or in creating a character. No, it's boring. It's just right. It's, uh, boring. <laughs> right. Like you're equipped to play an actor maybe, but not to play a human or something. Mm-hmm. But totally. it's also true that right now we're all kind of going through a trauma. Mm-hmm. And if you're not feeling inspired, there's perfectly good reason for that. And that, and that it's okay. And you can still keep showing up and, and, mm. but it's, it's that forgiveness of yourself and, and realizing that those parts of you that are gnarly and icky and that you think, Oh, nobody would love me if they knew about oh. this, about me. When you show up with those things in your, in your characters and in your scene work, mm. those are the things that connect you actually most to other people because they're also scared to show those things. So when they're watching that and you're revealing these parts of you, it actually becomes much more interesting and bonds you to this, these parts that we're just so scared to expose to each other at times. Wow. Uh, Okay. That's so (laughs) so brilliant. (laughs) On this podcast, we ask a lot about process and a lot about, you know, how to be in the moment when you're in, when you're acting and you, you just hit that out of the park. <laughs> it's, it's true. It's like, uh, it's a vulnerability thing. It's a bravery thing. It's accessing the parts of yourself that are our flaws or what make us human. And then it's like using that in a character, right? Yeah, totally. Would you say that you have like a set process? I assume it's different for every role. I feel, um, I know, I guess when I get scenes, I will usually, if I have the time, because sometimes you don't have the luxury of the time, I'll sure. take, I'll, I'll, you know, whether it's clean my house or shower or do things around that seem a little bit mundane and take each line 
and just carry it with me and mm -hmm. say it a few times over and over and over again. Um, because you start discovering sometimes the words speak to you or there might be a word you don't fully understand. So then you wow. go and look it up or whatnot. And then once that kind of feels that way, then I might pick up another line and take it with me on a walk or whatnot and kind of going through the scene and the, the lines that way. And you start realizing maybe intention or just discovering mm. the way it, it almost becomes a, um, a conversation with the writer that you're trying to Amazing. really take the words and put them in your body. So I would say as far as like proper craft, it also helps with memorizing lines emotionally mm. and not so much just on the paper. Gotcha. So that's always really nice. And then I, you know, I operate a lot with love. Where's the love for this character? Mm. Is it mm. lack of love? Are they needing love? Is this, uh, is it hitting upon a trauma or whatever it may be? Or is this a, a, point, a point where they're actually feeling love, expressing love? Because I think a lot of times those are the ghosts that we carry with ourselves in life is this need to be seen, which usually yeah. comes from a need to be loved or whatever that might be for, for each character. So I'd say that's probably the closest thing to something that I probably do with every gotcha. character, every audition uh, that I am working on. But other than that, I think it's also giving yourself the liberty to be, to be different, you know, and I, and watching a lot of stuff to be inspired reading, uh, feel from the masters. We have these, gotcha. we have these, this ability to watch YouTube or to watch yeah. some limitless TV at home or movies and, and just kind of seeing what you can kind of rip from, from people that for some reason inspired you emotionally. And then at, when you put all the pieces together, it's, it ends up being something that is completely your own because it's your, from mm -hmm. your voice. Amazing. And that's that, yeah, that's that inspiration you're talking about of what's going to kick something off. Or I love this idea of doing something that's sort of active. So the lines are in your body. Yeah. But that's not just about, that's not just for your line memorization. That's for like really getting to know a character. Right. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, you're, because also ideally, you know, if you're in the room auditioning or in a scene, you know, you probably are going to actively be doing things and you'd be surprised at how little, yeah. even like little lines all of a sudden start taking on different meanings and different intentions. And it just loosens things up for you mm -hmm. that you, and, and it gives you the opportunity for you to be surprised as opposed to kind of contriving what you think this should be. You just kind of are like, Oh, that's interesting. I didn't, that, that felt that way this way. That's cool. I love this idea of having a con it's like having a conversation with the writer. Like yeah. Getting to know the lines. Oh my God. <laughs> but then you must have actual conversations with, with, for example, Tanya. We are very lucky that we uh, get to, we're just in very, very close to her. And she's also made it a point that the writers um, are very close to us as actors. So we're, you know, mm -hmm. even though the show has been filmed and signed, sealed, delivered for a bit, we're still, friends with each other. So it's, it's always fun. And with a show like Vida also, what's so beautiful is that it's written by Latinx people mm -hmm. and it's a Latinx show. Um, so there's this opportunity to really see yourself in a way that doesn't normally happen. So we're constantly like, there's just little details or little code switching or mm -hmm. things that um, feel so great. Or sometimes even things that you might not know. Oh, I didn't know that slang. Oh, that's a slang that's very specific to this part of East LA. Uh, and yeah. that's something that I think is a really, uh, just, you know, a really cool um, sure. thing to get to, experience and you know tanya is very i mean she'll she'll be in the middle of writing us scenes and then uh send us a video message and you know crying and saying oh i just wrote oh, the gosh. love scene between so and so and so and so it's so great like you know and that's uh, i i feel like that's a cool relationship that i think um with this being my first tv show i don't know if it i i don't know if i'll have it again but maybe i will yeah, it's quite the uh, first real first big TV show to have on your resume because there's truly nothing like Vida on television. Like yes, this all Latinx writers room you're describing is not <laughs> at all a common phenomenon to say the least. Yes, it is, and it's it's um you know it is it's such a beautiful beautiful mm. movement to get to be a part of because it feels like it's more than just the show. It's mm -hmm. about. Uh, what doors a show like this can open 
for other creators and yes. other people and it not even just being a latinx thing it's 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 an american story it's a story mm -hmm. about sisters it's a story about families and that being something that um that i i i it's I, I still, to this day, when I watch episodes, I'm blown away with uh, just the the luck that I got to be mm -hmm. part of something so so special. We just watched the first two episodes in Atlanta at the SCAD Film Festival, and oh, uh, that's a second episode. We a second episode of season three just completely emotionally tumbled all of us as a cast and we had to do a Q and a afterwards. And I think, mm -hmm. I don't know if any of us really pulled ourselves together to be able know. to do that. We were just full on bawling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You can tell a lot of love and emotion goes into the show. Well, and I actually, I wanted to ask too, I know you've, you've certainly recounted the story because it's an extraordinary story, but how did you get involved in Vida? I understand it's kind of the ultimate backstage dream of uh, you made all of the right moves with the casting director. And um, I'd love to hear about that whole process and the audition part of it as well. Yeah, it's, I guess the part, that part's fun. I think the part that's also important to also highlight was the fact that for, I want to say a good Few, like a few years, maybe about two or three years before that, I actively was trying to get an agent, actively mm -hmm. was trying to book even a few lines on a TV show and, um, and w wasn't able to get an agent because a lot of times they already had, as I was told actually more than once, uh, one ethnically ambiguous person on their roster. Oh my gosh. And, um, and just, you know, you, you needed credits to be able to do, to maybe get with a better agency. But then there was the aspect of not fitting into the exact character of what a Latina woman was meant to be. Mm. So there was, there was that and a lot of continuing on. And I think at the beginning of that year, I'd signed with a new manager mm -hmm. and he, we had met with a few different agents and I think there was, you know, some interest, but not anything, you know, too exciting. And I remember having a conversation with my manager and saying, Hey, why don't we take a beat with these agent meetings? Because I don't want to be with somebody if they're not completely excited about me. I don't sure. want to have somebody that's like, let's give her a shot and see how she does. And that, I think in retrospect probably should have been a lot scarier than it was saying, oh. you know what, I don't want to be with an agent or continue this song and dance with agencies when I feel like I'm just trying to like prove myself and convince them of something. I want them to see something in me and be excited about that. That sounds like good advice to just really stick to your guns and you only want to work with somebody who's really wants to work with you. Right. Totally. But I think, you know, as an actor, you have no credits. It, it can yeah. be a little scary because you're just like, let me take what I can get. Yeah. And also knowing, knowing how you work. So some people might work well in that situation and that's okay too. Being like, you know, I'm going to prove them. Mm. I knew that I, I wasn't, that just isn't the way that I, I work. I just, I'm like, you either are into this or you're not. And, mm. and if you're not, that's cool. I'll, I'll find somebody else that that is. So I kind of jokingly said my manager said to my manager, I think I want to show up to agency meetings when I have a series regular show under my belt. Mm -hmm. Um, and he, he laughed and he said, all right, let's give it a shot, you know, because and my manager also was working really hard. So I was getting auditions and, and that was all going well. And then mm -hmm. I had before him booked the fear of the walking dead series. Mm -hmm. It had gotten nominated for a short form series Emmy and from there, I ended up at the Emmy Awards. Very cool, uh, the, yeah. Yes, Creative Arts Emmys, which was crazy. And even with that, that took a little bit of, uh, you know, the network wasn't really they have these four year consideration events and, or they'll like send mm -hmm. out screeners or something and include it in their four year consideration package. And they weren't including our little series on there, which oh. seems strange. I, I didn't understand. It was, you know, it was, uh, the second year that they, that that was a possibility. So Kelsey Scott, who plays, uh, uh, the other character on that for the walking dead show, her mm -hmm. and I were just, just said, you know what, let's just do our own screening. So 
she was oh, part of, she was part of the academy. She invited a bunch of her academy friends to come. We oh. cooked an entire dinner. I cooked an entire dinner for everybody at my fr my friend closed down like a part of his restaurant and we did a screening and oh, we man. invited everybody and you know and we, like I said next so that was also part of it kind of just being thinking oh these are the rules but that's I don't super proactive. agree with that. And yeah. why not? Like, let's just oh, very cool. do this. So we, we did that. And we, um, we also dropped off little, um, little flyers to the casting offices because the casting offices can, um, they can, uh, they, they can vote for the Emmy awards. Yeah. They may or may not come, but it's nice to show up with an invitation to something as opposed to, Hey, here's me, catch me on, you know, this show. Yeah. Um, it's, it's coming in and offering something. So we did that ended up at the creative arts Emmy awards. I had no idea what I was in for, for some reason, I just didn't, it didn't occur to me what that was going to be like once I was there. And we, I remember getting out of the car and all of a sudden being surrounded by a safari of celebrities mm -hmm. and looking around thinking, oh gosh, I didn't realize it was going to be like this and having this giant red carpet. And it was, mm -hmm. it was crazy. I met Carmen Cuba at that uh, award ceremony. She had given a really, really beautiful speech uh, about being an immigrant and that mm -hmm. her being the face of what immigrants are capable of and what they look like. And it was, it, I was really, really inspired by it. And when I saw her at an after, at the after party, I went up to her to tell her how, how it had affected me. And then, uh, within that week I had been called in to, uh, read for Viva, which was her, the show that she was casting. Mm -hmm. And she, uh, I, I, I originally went in for cruise, which was the love interest. I tested mm -hmm. for cruise and that was my first test. It was the end of the year and I was completely just beside myself and then didn't get it. And I was uh -huh. like, I was like, you know what? And it was really strange because I felt like I would have been more devastated, but I just kind of sat there and I said, you know what? I'm going to really honor the fact that I just did my first test. Mm. And awesome. I had never gotten that far and I felt really good about what I did in the room. And I said, you know what, I'm just going to be excited about this. And then I want to say about a week later, I got a call that the showrunner wanted to meet with me and, uh, just, I didn't know what was going to happen. I went into the room. I had been given some sides the night before, but not really a character breakdown or anything like that. And when I went into the room, I, I, I just kind of, they, Co or I guess they like directed me into this character because they didn't tell me who it was or oh, whatnot. Really? Yeah, so I didn't I didn't even come in there prepared with an Emma because yeah, I didn't know I was lead. auditioning for Emma. Gotcha. Wow. <laughs> until um until once I was in there and as we were going through that um I started realizing oh wow this is for the lead that they wow. had already, they had already cast and uh and then by the the next morning I well actually that night all the writers started following me on Instagram and I was oh, like wow. what does this mean <laughs> <laughs> and um and then by the next day I'd gotten the call that um that I had booked the they'd recast the lead role with me and wow. my life my life changed very quickly after that Amazing. <laughs> and it sounds like a lot of that. It's just so cool to hear that a result, so much of the result of that was you being just really saying screw the rules with the TV Academy stuff. And like, I had no idea that you, you did a screening of your own. Yeah. <laughs> and just the, the, having the foresight to go up to Carmen Cuba and it wasn't like you were trying to, you were angling for a job. You were connecting to her as a human. Right. And that's, that's kind of going back to what, we were saying before is that yeah. it, that's, that's really the most important thing is to, is, is looking at yourself and realizing who you are and how you want to show up in the world, uh, is so much more powerful and more interesting because then it's never attached to an outcome. It's you're mm -hmm. going to be fine. You know where you're going. It's just a matter of finding the way to get there. And, mm -hmm. and I, I really feel completely, um, just floored also by, I know that I am where I am because of a tribe, because of the people that believed in me and supported me, even from my friend 
who owned a restaurant and he mm-hmm. he was like, you know what, I'm going to close this part of the restaurant so you can do a little screening and, and use my kitchen, uh, Marcel Vigneron. He really believed in me. And then I had a, and that was just as a friend. I mean, he's a chef. He's not trying to do anything with acting. He was just like, you know what, yeah, come, come in and, mm-hmm. and do this. And then um, I had an acting uh, teacher, uh, Marjorie Ballantyne, uh, who was trained by Stella Adler and I remember I'd kind of do privates with her every once in a while. And at some point she was, she was pretty adamant about me coming to her class. And I was really kind of nervous about that. And I was just like, I don't really know if I want to be in a class with a bunch of people. And Mm -hmm. sometimes the culture felt, would would feel a little bit uh, not nurturing. And she, Mm -hmm. and and honestly, when it came down to it, I was like, I don't even know if I can afford it. Mm-hmm. And she, sure. she was just like, I believe in you. She's like, I want you to just come. I won't charge you. She's like, I just need you to promise me you're going to work hard. That's wow. it. Just okay. work hard. And, uh, and having her, uh, I mean, I still coach with her throughout all of the Vita episodes and everything. Mm-hmm. And um, just the, the fortuitous circumstance of her being this Latino woman uh, Let's see. and having, you know, just who would have known that, that, that friendship and that her belief in me would then move into essentially working on the show. And when I booked it, she was already working with, uh, I think two of the other actors on the show. <laughs> Wild. It's, it is a small world, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Yeah. Which is a good thing. It's, it's, it's having a tribe is so important. Oh man. Because it's, you know, it's, there's the ups, there's the downs. I think the one of the most beautiful things to align yourself is this idea of a body of work. So, mm. you know, you're going to have movies that are going to do amazing or roles that you're going to do amazing. You're going to have roles that maybe that didn't work out. Maybe try something. <laughs> it wasn't really the greatest thing. Sure. Fine. Because you're not defined by any one of those moments. You're, gotcha. you're working yeah. towards a body of work. You're working towards the ups and the downs and the hits and the misses. And obviously you, you work your hardest to show up and do the best that you can, but it's okay if it's not always like the most incredible thing anyone's ever seen. I mean, as I think our job is just to really find authenticity and honesty in our work. And sometimes the muses show up and sometimes they don't. (laughs) Again, that is pure gold. (laughs) We are going to fully uh, use that as a clip in promoting this podcast. Um, I did want to ask, so one, I wanted to ask one specific thing about Vida and because we're backstage and we've actually, we've been covering more recently um, intimacy coordinators Mm -hmm. and how to navigate that, you know, the environment of shooting sex scenes safely. And I know there's just, there's a lot of sex on Vida. There's just, yes, it's, it's, it's fabulous. It's one of the reasons that it makes it such a unique show I'm wondering, has anything changed from, I guess it was 2018 that you were first filming to now? Because I know that intimacy coordinators have only recently become much more of a presence on a set. Yes. I, this is our first, or was our first season using an intimacy coordinator. And something that I found really, really incredible is that even on a set as female driven as ours and as, um, supportive and inclusive as ours there really is something incredible about having someone whose only job is to make sure that you're comfortable in that situation and make sure that the other actors are comfortable in the situation because even with our producers and with the dps and the directors as much as they can try to be there for you in those moments they have other stuff that they're worried about yeah Mm. so they're no matter how hard you try, you're still worried about the lighting, the budget, the, you know, the going over for lunch, all of those things. So to have somebody whose only job is to check in, Hey, are you doing okay? Do you feel comfortable? And we would have conversations beforehand on what we were comfortable about, uh, as actors and those things being, being an important part of, of just creating that safe space for uh, for everyone involved. I mean, I think women have historically um, kind of suffered the brunt end of feeling uncomfortable on set, but that's not to say that men can't feel that way. I know Raul Castillo, who plays Baco, he he mentioned the fact that when he was, when, during one of our sex scenes, there was a point where he kind of looked around and realized, I think I'm the only guy in this room. And what that might, what how that, I don't want to say it made him feel uncomfortable, but it was an awareness. Yeah. Um, that I think was interesting. And, and, uh, you know, I think with intimacy coordinator, it's still, it's brand new and it's an evolving 
evolving trade, but I am, I think as it goes along, we can only really benefit from it because then it also gives you uh, the freedom with these sex scenes and these sexualities to kind of maybe write or go places that maybe are are stretching the boundaries, mm -hmm. but within a place that the actors feel taken care of. And that creates mm -hmm. something that I think is is great. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. I mean, again, with again, here I am again with the advice question, but... <laughs> For anyone who's maybe new to a sex scene, like what's someone who's maybe uh, on the earlier side of their career, what should they know? How should they protect themselves? Maybe, especially in the case of there not being an intimacy coordinator on the side? Mm -hmm. I think uh, it's important to not be scared to ask for things. So if, mm -hmm. if that is something that you want, I think uh, you can go through and be really clear if that's what you want. And I think there's uh, making sure that even before you're on the set, having conversations with the director, with the other actor, what do you feel comfortable? I want you to feel and opening the door to making sure that they feel comfortable. And, and then that creates an open dialogue and conversation with you and the other, the mm -hmm. other actor to make sure that you're, you're in that space that mm -hmm. is, it, it really opens for creativity. Mm. I know with Roberta Calindras and I, we're very close. So I think the intimacy coordinator was not used to, to actors that are as comfortable That's as we weird. are. Yeah, which yeah. Was, which was funny. We're like, oh, we don't need that guard. We don't need the thing. And she would just be like, yeah, um, yeah, but we, we, we should, we should. And we're like, oh, okay, I got it. Yeah. <laughs> and I think, uh, but it, in the end, it was actually nice to have somebody there continually checking in. Um, yeah. Because I would, because Robert and I happened to be really comfortable with each other was one thing. But if I hadn't been, then sometimes you're like, oh, I don't want to say anything because I might offend the other person. And just really ask, knowing what you want and not being afraid to ask for it. And if you need to pull somebody aside, if it's a, and ideally having mm -hmm. conversations before the scene even shows up with, with what you're comfortable with yeah. and being okay to all of a sudden not be comfortable with it in, in the middle of the scene saying, you know what, actually this is, yes. this isn't great for me and not feeling, I mean, and it truly just filters over to the way we show up sexually in the world. I think, you know, with oh, a lot yeah. of what's happening with hashtag me too and, um, you know, just the disassembling of the rape culture mentality. I think that that's an important thing. Mm -hmm. I think sometimes as women, we think, oh, I've already started this kind of sexual act, so I can't pull away now. And at some point mm -hmm. you just say, yeah, it's your body. You actually have an ability to pull away at any point and, and not, mm -hmm. and take away consent, even if you've already given it. Yeah, that's a, yeah, that's a really good point. That's really excellent advice. Michelle, thank you so much. This is so amazing. Oh, thanks so much. Of wisdom. <laughs> um, <laughs> I want to ask you some not quite rapid fire, but we, we asked these kind of backstagey questions. First of all, how did you get your SAG card? Extra work. Okay. Oh, what, and what was that first show? I don't even remember, which is the worst part. Oh, wow. Wow. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it was, uh, it was actually a, a friend of mine was, uh, producing something and, um, and invited me to come on set and then they had extra SAG cards because I was going on set just to kind of oh. make a little extra money and see the way a set worked. And then mm -hmm. I was, you know, going to do extra work because I needed a little extra money. And then um, I was able to get the vouchers to, to get it. Gotcha. Very cool. <laughs> um, what's one performance that every actor should see and why? Oh, um, oh my goodness. <laughs> one performance. I'm trying to think of ones that have like shook me. I mean, maybe I'll, can I come back to that one? Absolutely. No, it's a, it, there's in the whole history of acting, it's like sort of hard to, I sprung that on you. What about your worst audition horror story? Oh yeah. I had one, um, that it was, so the whole time I'm acting, I'm actually vocalizing what's happening inside of my head. So it was, I'm doing my own voiceover and it was very strange. Number one for them to ask us to do that. Oh, really? And, and it got really, really bad. I realized halfway through, I was like, this is really bad. I'm really bad. And now I'm thinking about how bad I am. So in my mind, I thought, you know what? I'm going to make this the worst audition these people have ever seen. Oh, oh my gosh. 
<laughs> like you sabotaged yourself. In my mind, I was like, this is bad and I can feel it and it's not going to get any better. There's no coming back from this point. So I'm just going to double commit and I'm going to make this feel worse. So at some point, you know, I'm supposed to kind of feel a little hurt and fall down. And instead I'm like falling to my knees and doing this like dramatic oh, death gotcha. scene. Oh gosh. <laughs> It's better to own it, I guess, and just see yourself out. <laughs> I mean, at that point, it was just like, I'm going to just, I know I'm going to get in the car and probably cry and be like, why didn't Aww. you do the thing? So instead, I might as well just make a funny story out of this. Oh, amazing. For this precise interview so that you can tell it. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> um, what is your number one piece of advice for your younger self? Like if you could go back in time, maybe something that you were particularly ignorant about that you wish you'd known sooner. I wish I had found confidence sooner. I think uh -huh. um, I spent a lot of time even, I think truly in my heart, wanting to be seen as an actor and wanting to take the steps to do it, but then not really owning it. I was scared to mm. be this, like, especially in LA, so often people meet you and they'll say, oh, let me guess, an actress. And it, I always kind of got pride in saying, no, 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 I'm not. No, I'm, well, I'm not like one of those. And uh -huh. I wish that I'd found that, that, that place within me that said, yeah, I am. And yeah. that's, that's, that's who I am. So I think that, you know, I did commercials for a while before being able to do narrative uh, film and TV. Mm -hmm. And I think that that was like my safe way of being kind of being able to be around me on set without having to commit to the, uh, the heart, my heart that felt that that was something that I wanted to do. So I wish I, I wish I would have been like, you're going to, it's okay, kid. Like nobody, nobody else <laughs> defines you other than yourself. Totally. Yeah. 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 Don't let others define the path because there's, there is weirdly a lot of shame. There's a lot of shame around many different professions or like how we make our living. Yes. And it's like, just maybe just own it and the path will be created for you by doing that. Oh, totally. And it's just, you know what? No, it doesn't even matter. Whatever it is. I mean, even if you're kind of making a silly mess of yourself, then make a silly mess of yourself and then uh -huh. learn and you, and it all becomes material later. It all becomes material later. <laughs> it's all inspired. It's all for that walking into the audition room being a human. Yeah. And sometimes I think remembering, I, I, I feel like there was always, I always sat with the old lady. I mean, I still kind of do the old lady version of me retelling my life. And saying you oh, did wow. it like you did it and being like oh yeah and then remember that time where you thought it was all over and you could never recover and then you did and you know just <laughs> kind of that stuff i always think about her that's a really good technique that's yeah. good, maybe in, in the time of the coronavirus that's actually a good tip oh man we we're there for sure but you think of also throughout history um the amount of incredible art that has come from times mm -hmm. of of pain and despair. I mean, even, so you know, Anne Frank and the Holocaust or uh, just through the world wars or other pandemics. I mean, you, yeah. um, Bukowski has that, uh, that poem. Um, I can, I'm going to mess it up. It's like the air, the light, time and space. And it's thinking, oh, when I have this, then it's all going to work out uh, and then I'm going to be able to create. And he's like, no, honey, you're not, no. you're, you're going to create with your back on fire with kids crawling up the wall. If that's what you want to do. <laughs> The air, time, the light, and space have nothing to do with it. Uh, yeah, totally. Mm -hmm. There's there's no excuses. Um, okay, what is one performance every actor should see and why? <laughs> you know who I read? I, and I don't, I honestly, this is not the answer I would have thought that I would have come up with, but uh -huh. I really feel like Ellen Bernstein and Requiem for a Dream, for some reason, oh, cool. is just mm. such a badass in the way that she kind of did so much with within this like kind of confined character space I think was is is actually really 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 cool it's um so I don't know that's not the answer I would have thought but it's who I who came into my head when I had time to sit with it yes well Michelle thank you so much I want to let you go and back back to your um your Instagram cooking and your chef's table and your creating the material for the next time you're able to you know create a character yeah but it's been so lovely to talk to you. Do you have any other parting words of wisdom for listeners of Backstage's podcast? I just, it's so surreal and cool to me that I'm getting to be in a position to talk to you all because, you know, I went to a high school in Miami where uh, the arts wasn't really uh, a huge part of that experience. And I was in a, you know, little acting class and 
you know, our teacher would get the backstage magazines and it's still so surreal. And I try to remind myself because it's easy to kind of get lost in the day in and day out. But I remind myself of that 14 year old going into that acting class mm -hmm. and seeing those backstage magazines and, and what that means. I think, um, that full circle, it's still really, really surreal. And, and that it's like, it's exciting. It's exciting to get to dream and have desires. So I'm, I'm really grateful for yeah. you guys' time and, and just, you know, hopefully whatever, whatever I have going on will hopefully inspire other people to kind of, you know, feel, feel confident and comfortable enough to go forward with, with what yes. they, it's dreams, but also plans. And, mm. and that's a beautiful, beautiful place to be at the beginning because you'll never get that place ever again. Sure. Yeah. Boy, that, that's a great note to end on. Thank you for all of this inspiration and just really great advice. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much for having me. It was so, so lovely. And you stay safe and stay sane. You too. Stay safe and sane. Yep. <laughs> that's our new sign off. Okay. Right. <laughs>